It's hot. It's steamy. It smells like sulfur. There's brimstone. Welcome to hell. It's cold in hell. It's cold in hell, they say. No, 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 not that hell. This is Coulter's Hell, a geothermal area right outside of Cody, Wyoming. Does this have anything to do with that giant volcano called Yellowstone that's just a couple of miles up that way? Let's find out as we take a look at the spectacular geology in the canyon, the geology down below me. We'll also see if we can find the Great Unconformity. That's right, it's back there, and we're gonna take a look at it. And for all you fans of structural geology, hey, I'm not leaving you out. There's some great faults to be seen on the backside of the anticline. But let's start here at the beginning, at Coulter's Hell. It's on the eastern side of the Rattlesnake Mountain anticline, and it's a really interesting geothermal hotspot. A lot of people mistakenly assume this is all because of Yellowstone, that gigantic volcano that's just a couple of miles away from us here in Cody. But in reality, this geothermal has nothing to do with Yellowstone at all. In fact, this is very similar to what's happening at Thermopolis, Wyoming. And I've got a video on that that I'll stick a, a link to in the comments section. You can see that. The yellowish color in these rocks down below me on the Shoshone River is due to sulfur infiltration of the Ten Sleep sandstone. And the Ten Sleep is, of course, a big Paleozoic sandstone that's Aeolian in origin, and it's a tremendous reservoir throughout the region. That's because it's got really good porosity and permeability that facilitates fluid flow, like oil, gas, and groundwater. And the fractures and faults associated with the anticline allow groundwater to come percolating up into the tent sleep. But not just any groundwater, this stuff's been down at the geothermal gradient close to the mantle, so it's superheated. But it's not just water that comes up, there's a variety of minerals from the Earth's mantle that also come up, and stuff like hydrogen sulfide, which is a gas, causes precipitation of sulfur in the rocks, giving it that yellow color. This is really common in volcanic areas all around the world, but also hydrothermal areas. And there's also travertine, which is essentially a hydrothermal limestone created when carbon dioxide from the mantle dissolves underlying limestone and precipitates it at the surface. In this case, the underlying limestone is hundreds of feet thick and forms the glorious Shoshone Canyon that we're gonna be driving through on the rest of this tour. Incidentally, Shoshone in the indigenous language means stinking river, and it was named that because of the really overwhelming smell of the sulfur at this particular stop. And you know, for geologists like me or people in the energy industry, Places like this here at Cody are really interesting because, of course, there's a growing interest in geothermal energy as a source for supplementing fossil fuels, nuclear, wind, solar, and so on. So there's a lot more studies happening on places like this recently than there have been probably in the last century or so. It's a great time to be studying geothermal. Here we are at the mouth of the canyon heading up towards Buffalo Bill Reservoir. This is the spectacular Madison Limestone. Uh, the stratigraphy here is very similar to the Wind River Canyon, which is not too far from us. It's to the east and to the south. I did a video on that last year, and again, I'll put a link to that in the comments. If you like this geology, you're going to love that. So this is that big Paleozoic carbonate deposit, and being a carbonate, you can just imagine how long it took to accumulate that. You know, you're talking millimeters a year, maybe centimeters a year. As we go that direction, we're actually going down section because all these beds are tilting. And as you can see, they're tilting to the east. So as we work our way west, we're actually going down stratigraphy older. We're gonna be getting into the Three Forks, Jefferson, Beartooth, and Bighorn. Those are all carbonates, dolomites, and so on. And we'll stop and take a look at them as we go. This is gonna be great. Let's start by talking about the Madison limestone and these other Paleozoic carbonates. You know, if we were to time travel back to this part of Wyoming to about 370, 350, 300 million years ago, we would have seen something that looks really different than today. It would have looked a lot like the Bahamas or the Florida Keys or some other areas like that in a tropical carbonate environment. Of course, in the Cretaceous, all this began to lift upwards and that was a result of the Laramide orogeny, the basement involved tectonic uplift, which caused the entire region to lift up thousands of feet above sea level. And in fact, when we get to the other side of the Shoshone Canyon at the dam at Buffalo Bill Reservoir, we're gonna be able to see some of the faults that were directly responsible for that uplift. Throughout the canyon, there's some really nice signs like this that fill you in on the geological background. So even if you're not getting everything I'm saying, or you've got this with the sound turned off, cause hey, who really wants to listen to my voice when there's pretty pictures to look at, you can always take a look at these signs. 
And now we're going to drive through the canyon. We're going to start here at the mouth and work our way west. So again, we're heading down section, getting into older rocks. And off to the right, you see those Paleozoic carbonates. There's some of the Madison. There's some Bighorn Dolomite in there. There's the Gallatin Limestone and a whole variety of other carbonates that serve as the source for that travertine that's back there on the river. We're working our way down towards the Cambrian now, and we're going to start seeing some of the heterolithic Grovant formation. And just like in the Wind River Canyon, the Grovant is not well exposed because there's a lot of mud and a lot of silt in it, so it weathers really easily into these slopes. And it's the tidal flat environment that came after the fluvial deposits of what's called the Flathead Sandstone. And the Flathead is the earliest sedimentary rock that we're going to see in the canyon. The exciting part about it is it sits on something that's called the Great Unconformity. This is it. This is the Great Unconformity. There are some good unconformities. There are some spectacular unconformities. But there's only one Great Unconformity. That is it. It's right before the first tunnel here in the Shoshone Canyon. So if you want to stop and take a look at it, there's some nice pullouts. You can safely pull off to the side and take a look. I'm going to go take a look at it, and you're coming with me. Let's go. This unconformity separates the two billion year old granite from the 500 million year old Cambrian flathead sandstone. We're missing about 1.5 billion years of time. Where did it all go? That's something we're going to talk about on the rocks. Let's get over there. Here on the south side of the road, the unconformity is absolutely spectacular. Check out the pinkish granitic. Nice. That's the basement. That's two billion years old. Look at that scour right there, a big, obvious, channelized scour with the Cambrian flathead sandstone sitting directly in and on it. There's no doubt this is a river system cutting into the granite, not terribly unlike what we're seeing here in the modern day Shoshone Canyon, where these granites and older rocks are being incised by the Shoshone River. Same process just happened to have been about 500 million years ago. And this Cambrian channel scour has an important clue and some useful information for us about where did that missing 1.5 billion years go. Simply put, it's not missing. It got transported away from here and out into the ocean. The Precambrian Oceans, the Cambrian Oceans, those rocks went somewhere and we actually know where a lot of them are. I've got to go lay hands on the Great Unconformity. This is something that it never gets old no matter where I'm seeing it. There it is. That is the Great Unconformity. You can see it in a lot of places in the Grand Canyon. You can see it in Scotland. You can see it on I-80 outside of Laramie. The Great Unconformity is actually not a single unconformity. It's a compound feature. It's a composite of many unconformities over 1.5 billion years of time. But it wasn't all weathered in one big event. Some people claim Snowball Earth resulted in scouring it off at one time. Yeah, but there was also tectonics at play. We know that prior to the Pennsylvanian, there was tectonic uplift of the ancestral Rockies. We know that from studies in Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico. And if you're a geo nerd like me, man, this can just absolutely make your day, make your week, make your vacation. Your kids might not get it, but hey, who cares? Not much further to go now before we hit the other side of the anticline where we're going to see that thrust fault. We're going to go through two shorter tunnels, make a quick stop, and then drive through the longest tunnel in the state of Wyoming. I stopped at this climbing area right before you go through the last tunnel before the dam. Not because I have any intention of climbing up here because I don't climb, but because there's a really fantastic suite of these basement rocks that you can take a look at if you're into that kind of thing. I'm not. I'm not even going to pretend to get into the nitty gritty details of this, but they've got a pretty interesting history that you can read up on nevertheless. And back into the truck and driving through, that's right, the longest tunnel in the state of Wyoming. It's pretty impressive, actually, as you're going through it. Uh, you know, I gave short shrift to the Archean, those Precambrian um, granites and gneisses back there at the last stop. But there's a lot of really exciting new information and new publications coming out on them. Ron Frost, who knows more about the Precambrian in North America than anybody in the world, is at the University of Wyoming. And I talked to him a little bit before this trip. He's got a GSA memoir coming out. So you want to keep an eye open for that if you're into the Precambrian history of North America. But here we are. We are at the parking lot for the dam. You can see the fault ahead right through my bug-clouded windshield. 
So we're going to take a look, walk around, and see what there is to see here. There's the dam, and as we're panning the camera a little bit to the right, we're looking south, you can see the big dipping, the structural dip in the carbonate beds. That's a Madison limestone up at the top forming the big cliff, and a variety of other Paleozoics, including the Galton limestone, the Bighorn Dolomite, and all the rest down there. Okay, this is really cool. Right behind me is the fault that facilitated uplift of the Rattlesnake Mountains Anticline, starting in the Laramide orogeny, probably sometime in the Cretaceous, around 70 million, 75 million years ago. This is the basement. This is that Nisic metamorphosed granite. There's all sorts of igneous, two billion year old rock. There's the fault. And on the opposite side of it is a bunch of that Paleozoic carbonates and clastics of the Flathead, Gallatin, Madison and so on throughout here. It's even easier to see back on the southern side of the reservoir. Take a look at that. You see those dipping beds. That's the Archean off to the left. That's a Mississippian Madison limestone up on the skyline. And if we start tracing in lines, just tracing the beds that we can see, you notice they're dipping up. But then something happens right in the middle there. There's these little arches. It's kind of humped up. And then continuing on, there seems to be an offset. That's because what we're actually seeing is the fault. There's a splay. It's a little Y-shaped fault where the thing is kind of pushed through and created a triangle zone. This simplified diagram shows, in essence, what's happening in front of us with those little splays off a master fault. Take a look behind the parking lot. You can see the other side of the anticline with the strata and all these carbonates dipping to the west. So you can see that flaggy, um, kind of heterolithic Grovant. That's tidal flat deposits. And again, I covered some of that in the Wind River Canyon video I did. So if you're really into um, Cambrian and Paleozoic deposits, check that one out. You might like it. The netting they've placed over this Cambrian um, outcrop is to prevent chunks of rock from falling off. As you can imagine, it's mostly muds and silts with some little um, layers of carbonate and sandstone, but it's prone to weathering. You can see it's been kind of scoured out. So chunks of that occasionally come down through people's windshields and chip their paint on their cars, and that just ruins some people's days. I can totally get it. Like, I understand that. So the netting is meant to hinder that process. I'm not sure how really effective it is, but it must be somewhat effective. Semi for scale. Getting close to the dam, and it's pretty interesting seeing how high the reservoir is. Um, They've got these fellows in little golf carts offering people rides to the dam from the parking area. And he told me it's at 93% capacity right now. So it's pretty full. This is all from snow melt. You see all the great organic material, all the woods and chunks of stuff that have floated down in. And you see the big fault planes in this stuff right here. Nice and smooth with little chatter marks in it. Look at that really nice, big, busted up, nice. And they just keep going through there. There's one, two, three, all big fault fracture planes. I'm not really an igneous kind of guy, but it's pretty cool to see this stuff and how it's been tortured over the billions of years. And there's all these little cross-cutting veins of felsic material cutting through some of the mafix. Um, a whole lot happened to these mountains before they uplifted in the Cretaceous. Good policy. Look at all that material washed down during the spring runoff. Pretty impressive. Holy cow. Talk about impressive. Look at that. And that's it. That brings us to the end of this particular trip to Shoshone Canyon. We've seen the great unconformity. We saw some geothermal activity that's not associated with Yellowstone, like a lot of people think. We learned about the geothermal gradient in hot springs. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time on The Outcrop. Take it easy.